This video is part of the Commercial Building Electrical Design Series. We've been looking at uh, special systems and, and other things related to design. And in this study, we want to, or in this video, we want to look at different electrical studies that can be uh, involved with uh, commercial building construction. So what are some of the electrical studies uh, that we might run into? Well, we have what's known as a fault current study. Uh, we can have a device coordination study and an arc flash study. Uh, these are the ones that are pretty typical. In addition to these, we can have a power flow study, a uh, code study, hazardous area classification study, uh, life safety study, and lighting studies. But as I said, these are the ones that are really considered the typical studies that you'll see involved with a construction project, uh, other client requested studies, which are what I call occasional studies that you might see are these, uh, these bottom studies here. So let's look at the three typical ones. Uh, that'll be what's in the scope of, of this uh, video. First, first one we'll look at is fault current study. So uh, this type of study is typically the first study performed on a new or sometimes electrical, uh, existing electrical distribution systems. Uh, in theory, when there's a short circuit in a system, the current flow through the short should be infinite, right? But we don't live in a theoretical world, we live in the real world. And so in the real world, this is not the case as there's a limit to how much current that can be supplied by a source. So, um, that being the case, we need to know what that, what that, you know, what that available current is, and then how it changes through our system. So this being the case, um, there will be a maximum available fault current that we can calculate at each location throughout our system. So the beginning of this process starts with the utility company as they are going to tell us what the maximum available fault is at the source or at the connection point. So this will usually be on the secondary side of their utility transformer. Uh, so as we travel through the system, then this amount is going to diminish due to voltage drop along the feeder. So we need to calculate it all the way throughout our system. So the way this is typically done is we simulate the system uh, in a computer model. And so there's several computer programs available on the market that can be used to mod model electrical distribution systems. And then uh, these can be used to calculate the fault current at each location throughout the system. Probably the two most popular programs in industry today are SKM. They're the ones that have been around the longest. They've been around since the 70s. And the, but another one that's pretty popular is ETAP. Uh, they both work in a similar manner and uh, they both model your system, you use a CAD system. We'll look at a picture of that here later. Uh, and then they can use this to perform various calculations on the system. So this is a typical output. This is from SKM, uh, one of these programs. And uh, you can see here, that it shows the available fault current. And so, you know, just dropping the errors here, here's the contribution that we would get from the power company so they can give it to us uh, in amps or in uh, MVA, which is, we can deduce it from that once we know the voltage. And so they actually gave it to us on the primary side here of our transformer. But then this program will then uh, use all the information about the system and calculate it throughout the system. So you can see here, uh, we can have 56.642 kiloamps, or that's a little over 56 and a half thousand amps. You can see just from this bus to this, going through this conductor and breaker, uh, drops, uh, you know, at least a, a noticeable amount to 55.24, 1,000 amps. And so this is uh, available uh, short circuit amperage is what this uh, what this stands for here. So once we have the available fault current at each location in the system, we can then use this to evaluate if the equipment is properly rated to withstand or to function in the presence of this fault. This is very important. It's one of the most important calculations we do because if it's not rated for it, then we're going to have a catastrophic event. 
So if the equipment is found, uh, if it's if it's found that the equipment is not properly rated, um, this is mentioned in our report, and we will usually give recommendations to how to remedy the situation. Sometimes it can be fixed by swapping out a breaker to a different breaker type that's rated for more. Sometimes you have to just change out the entire panel or entire disconnect or change fuses. There's a lot of different things we can do to correct this. So looking, going back to our previous snapshot of a model here, you know, we can see where we've already marked what the available fault current is. Uh, we can also see here for like for this bus, this ISC3P, that's what the equipment's rated for. And then uh, over here, this breaker as well, ISC rating is 65. So we want to make sure that this number is larger than this number. In other words, that it can function or withstand this fault current. If it's lower, then that's when we have a problem and we have to make some recommendations to fix that. So the second type of study, um, which usually is done in conjunction with this, uh, and is the device coordination study. So this study is commonly performed on new systems, uh, especially larger systems, and uh, uh, sometimes can be done on the smaller ones, but it depends on if you have adjustable breakers is really what it breaks down to. So the purpose of this study is to evaluate all the adjustable breakers in a system to ensure uh, that they are set such that the breaker closest to the load will trip first in the event of a fault or an overload condition. So this is to make sure that in the event of a fault condition, the least amount of the system and or equipment will be de-energized or taken down. So you would rather have a branch circuit trip, right, closer to your fault than you would have just the main breaker trip every time, right, and it just takes your whole facility down. So this is the purpose of this study, is to try to make sure that the, the breaker closest to the fault trips first. So this study is also performed using the, the model that we create in SKM or ETAP software. So these programs have vast libraries with all of the breakers and buses and wire information in there. So as long as we just tell it, you know, and put in the model what's there. Uh, the model should be complete. And so once the model of the system is completed, uh, the engineer then must go in and select different feeder paths throughout the system and examine all the curves of these breakers in each path to ensure that there's no um, out of order overlap of the breakers. In other words, you don't want uh, your main breaker to show that it'll be tripping before you know, a breaker down the line would trip. Uh, if there is overlap, then the engineer works to see if he can make adjustments to the breaker settings uh, to ensure that, you know, the right breaker trips first. So here's an example from a coordination study I've done before. So you can see I've picked a feeder path through, through my system, starting up here with the main circuit breaker, this MSB. You go through the main circuit board, go through a transfer switch, uh, go through a different panel, go through a transformer, another breaker, and down to my panel here at the bottom. So, you know, you can have multiple, multiple branches throughout your system. So you kind of think it's kind of time consuming to do these studies because you have to keep picking all these different uh, pathways through your system. So as you can see, anywhere there's a breaker, the curve for that breaker is shown over here. So for instance, this PD MSBA BA is the pink one, uh, kind of this pink colored one here. Uh, we come down, we could see uh, this PD CHDPA, that's this purple one here. Um, and we can have this PD CLA, uh, that's the green one here. And so the, the idea is that as we come down with these names, that the curves would, you know, come down in order. So as we get closer and closer to this final load, you know, the breaker, this PDCLA would be the closest one. So it is, you can see it's the furthest one to the left. So that's the closest to the load. But as we move to the right, <clears throat> we're going to see a couple of problems here. Uh, first one is our main breaker, which is this pink one, like I said, it should be the furthest to the right. Well, in this case, it is not this brown one, which is the, the, the breaker associated with our uh, transfer switch, uh, it is not. So there's a possibility that the main could break, the main breaker would trip before this one would. 
We have a second problem in this purple one here. Um, if you look at the order over here, you'd see that it comes before the blue and the green. So it should actually be outside of those. So um, what this means then is we have overlap problem right here, two problems with uh, our main breaker and uh, this C uh, CHDPA breaker. And so we need to move them to the right if possible. So um, when I change the next slide, you're going to see them move and you'll see where they are. So notice now where they are, they're kind of in the mix of things. And notice on the next slide where they are after I make the adjustment. So here they've been adjusted. So you can see this pink one was pulled back and the purple one was pulled back. Now there's still a little bit of overlap here between the purple and the brown breaker. Uh, that's not uncommon. You can't always get rid of all the overlap, but you can at least try to, to make it uh, as, as good a situation as possible. Same thing with like the green and the brown here. Uh, excuse me, the green and the blue here. You see there is some overlap, but for the most part, they're, they're in the right order. So in this case, uh, we have adjusted the overlap to where it is better coordinated, it's more well coordinated. So how do we do that? How exactly do we do that? Well, you see in these boxes, these are all the different settings that you have for the different breakers. Uh, so for this first one, if you were to go back, you'd see this short, this STPU, which stands for short time pickup. It was set to, I believe, five. And so when I adjusted it to three, uh, that may actually slid this curve uh, out of the way of the other breakers. Same thing with this one. I adjusted this uh, instantaneous setting here and you can go back and check it with the previous setting with, the, with that adjustment. It moved this curve over. So this isn't perfectly coordinated, but it's definitely much better coordinated than what we saw before. So, you know, that, that's the purpose of these of these types of studies. So the third study and the final one that we're going to look at um, is uh, the arc flash study. So this study is typically done in concert with the previous two studies as they all can be performed from the same model in SKM and ETAP. So you'll usually see this, this group of studies done at one time. Uh, and it's easy to do once we get a model built. Uh, this study uses the available fault current at each location along with the characteristics of the breakers uh, throughout the system to calculate the available uh, energy at each bus location. And then we use this information to calculate the potential to arc. And so, you know, there is a, there's always a chance that when you're working on energized equipment and you got tools and you're banging around in there that you could cause something to arc over, even though you don't touch it directly, you could get close enough to where it could arc over to you. So once we make this calculation, this information is then used to assign a category, which is defined in NFPA 70E, which is the, uh, life, the electrical safety code um, at each location. And this category gives guidance uh, through labels, and I'll show you some of the labels that we put on each piece of equipment as to you know, what type of PPE, which is your personal protective equipment. Um, you'll see PPE abbreviated a lot. So what is required there to, for the electrician to have on to work on this equipment while it's energized and him to stay safe. So uh, it's a pretty important study. It is required by OSHA. So if you have a facility um, that you are a part of and then you walk through and you notice there's no labels on the panels you know you might mention to them that hey you know if OSHA is going if OSHA shows up for a surprise visit and they don't see those labels you will get a, a significant fine for this so uh, and, you know it's something that uh, the owner needs to do and not to mention that it protects the people working on their system and their and their equipment and, and assets So let's go back to another snapshot of the model. This again is just the model from SKM. It's the previous one. I've just kind of moved the, the window to a different location. So you can see at each bus here, uh, as part of the information before we were looking at the available fault current and what the rating was, but if you come down here, we got the instant energy, which that's always going to be presented in calories per centimeter squared. That's the way that's calculated. And so you'll see, you'll have a value there for each of them, like five, a little over five and a half. Uh, here it's 0.19, here it's 6.5, and, and so that'll translate using the tables from NFPA 70E to a PPE category, and so you can see these are category 2, this is category 0, um, 
So, you know, this is what's going to tell you what type of PPE you need to wear. Uh, in some cases, you might have a PPE category, which is just called dangerous, which just means there isn't anything you can wear that's going to protect you from this. And you'll find this a lot in the main circuit, main circuit uh, switchboard or the main transformer. There's just so much available energy there that the potential to arc is so great. There's really nothing you can wear that's going to protect you adequately. So, you know, we just tell that what that what that category means is hey you really just can't work on this while it's energized you're going to have to do an outage to work on this piece of equipment so what do these categories mean what do the labels look like we're going to take a look at that here in just a second so let's look at some of these labels um, these are the types of labels that you'd see so uh, here you see a category zero uh, category one you'll notice as we go from one to the other uh, this P minimum PPE, they start to describe more and more stuff you have to wear. Uh, here you can see the calculations, how many calories per centimeter squared, and what's the safe distance, you know, to work with this before you need the PPE on. Um, category 2 label, you can see these numbers go up and the descriptions go up more and more and more and more, th more, and more PPE you have to wear, and the distances increase. Category 4 is the highest category. Uh, that uh, we can have on a piece of equipment that you can still find PPE to make it safe enough to work. And then finally, if you do come across one of those where there is no PPE, uh, which is usually over about 40 calories per centimeter squared, which you can see here, we're way over that. Uh, we just say danger. It's, there's no safe PPE that exists, so energized work is prohibited. So you're likely to see these labels on panels. And that's what they are. These are arc flash labels um, you know, required to give information to keep uh, technicians safe as they work on uh, different pieces of equipment. So what are the categories? Well, let's look a little closer at those. Uh, so here's category one, and this is up to four calories per centimeter squared. Uh, you can see it's not a whole lot more than what a normal electrician might wear. You need some leather gloves. You need a arc flash arc rated face shield hard hat you're going to need anyway safety goggles you're going to need anyway usually hearing protection you're going to need anyway um, so you'll need these arc rated pants and uh, sleeve shirts and what these usually are depends on the fabric or the material you know because there's certain material like some types of polyester or whatever that you know if you were to get burned that fabric actually melts into your skin and so you know it's almost impossible to get out whereas you just have cotton it just burns and it's going to burn you but it doesn't graft into your skin and so you know we try to minimize the impact of that and then leather footwear so it's pretty minimal impact for category one uh, if we go to category two which is up to eight calories between four and eight calories per centimeter squared uh, it gets a little more involved um, we usually Put on an arc rated jacket, uh, arc rated uh, little face mask thing, hearing protection, safety goggles, that's all the same. So you don't really have a whole lot different, uh, just a little bit more uh, involved here. So up to category two is not too bad. Category three is where it starts to get a little more inconvenient. And this is between eight and 25 calories per centimeter squared. And then uh, you'll hear sometimes electricians refer to the beekeeper suit. This is where they got to put on the beekeeper suit. Um, so it's an arc rated flash suit, pants and a jacket, um, you know, the shield and all that type of stuff. So this, this one is when it starts to kind of impact their ability to work. Then we go to category four and this is, like I said, get up to 40 calories per centimeter squared. And this is even a more involved beekeeper suit. Um, it's a little more heavy duty. And, uh, you know, the guys really hate it when they have to put this on because, I mean, those things are hot. It's hard to move around. It's hard to see real well. And so, you know, when we do arc flash studies, um, you know, if we have anything that's rated above a category two, usually which above a category two is where we got to put on the so-called beekeeper suits, we will do some investigating to see if we can find ways to reduce that category, which sometimes we can change out a breaker, use a more... Uh, highly rated breaker or something like that and we can reduce it but uh, more often than not we can't and um, but if we can we'll make the recommendation try to help them out so uh, if you see the labels and you know see those categories you know be aware that you know you don't want to be around or work on those things if they're energized and if you are you need to want to have the proper PPE equipment on to do that